Hello everyone, today we are going to talk about cells. The study of cells is known as the cytology. So whenever you see the suffix logi, that would mean study of, and cite means cells. So cytology is the study of cells. And we cannot see cells with our naked eye, so we have to view them under the microscope. Uh, we have different types of cells, and we can group them under eukaryotes and prokaryotes. We are going to focus on um, taking a look at eukaryotic cells and taking a look at um, different organelles within the eukaryotic cells and the features uh, that eukaryotic cells have. Most eukaryotic cells, and of course human cells are eukaryotic cells, most of these cells have three basic uh, features. Uh, the first one is a plasma membrane, which is going to be the outer boundary surrounding the cell. Uh, the second feature that most cells have uh, is a cytoplasm. And cytoplasm is basically made up of two major components. The cytoplasm, it's made up of fluid, which is known as cytosol, and that cytosol is found inside of the cell, so that's the fluid inside of the cell. Uh, another thing inside of the cell is uh, an organelle, or basically a bunch of organelles. Organelles and cytosol make up what's known as the cytoplasm. The third feature that most cells have uh, would be a nucleus. And the nucleus is the control center of the cell because this is where the DNA is stored. And the DNA is the blueprint of the cell. Plasma membrane is found amongst all cells. How does a plasma membrane look like? It's a bilayer, meaning that it's made up of two layers. It's a phospholipid, so it's made up of phosphates and lipids. The phosphate heads are facing both the inside and the outside of the cell. So you have some phosphates right here facing the outside of the cell, and you've got some phosphate heads uh, down here facing the inside of the cell. Inside the cell, there is um, fluid, and outside the cell, there is also fluid. So those phosphate heads are known to be hydrophilic. Hydro meaning water, philic meaning uh, loving. So those phosphate heads, they can tolerate water, and so we refer to them as hydrophilic. Right here in the middle, uh, we do have the phosphate, uh, sorry, we do have the lipids, and the lipids right here in the middle, those are known to be hydrophobic. Hydrophobic meaning that they do not tolerate water. They have phobia of water. So that's how uh, a plasma membrane looks like, kind of like a sandwich, um, with two layers of phosphate heads, and right in the middle, right in the middle, you do have the fat. Embedded in the plasma membrane, you have those um, proteins right there, and those proteins embedded in the plasma membrane act as channels to allow substances to move into and out of so as we previously saw in uh, the previous slide, the plasma membrane, it's a bilayer, so it's made up of two layers uh, of phosphate heads and lipid tails. So here are the phosphate heads facing both the outside and the inside of the cell, and right here in the middle, you would have the lipid portion. Uh, embedded within the plasma membrane, we have some proteins which we refer to as integral proteins. And those integral proteins could act as channel proteins, allowing molecules to uh, pass into or out of the cell. 
um, some integral proteins, they are um, glycoproteins, so they are uh, proteins attached to a piece of a carbohydrate, so we refer to it as glycoproteins. And some of these integral proteins, other than acting as a channel proteins, um, some of them can actually act as uh, a flag, kind of flagging the cell, allowing your immune system to recognize that this is your cell. And so that's pretty important because if your immune system doesn't know that these cells are yours, uh, your immune system might attack them. So some of these proteins act as, um, as a flag to tell your immune system that basically don't attack us, we are on the same side. Um, there are some proteins that we have which we refer to as peripheral proteins, and those uh, proteins are not embedded um, inside of the plasma membrane. That's why we call them uh, peripheral proteins. Uh, we are also going to talk about uh, those filaments of the cytoskeleton. You can kind of see them already right here, but we are going to talk about them in more detail. And basically, those are protein fibers that are going to maintain the shape of our cells. The cell. Another common organelle found in all eukaryotes, it's the nucleus. In the nucleus, we refer to it as the control center because this is where the DNA resides. Human DNA is known to be linear and it's about six foot long. So to fit into the nucleus, it has to coil itself around some proteins. And when it coils itself around proteins, we refer to it as the chromatin. Now, when the chromatin coils itself even more, we refer to it as the chromosome. The nucleus, it's covered by an envelope and that envelope it has pores within it to allow the passage of substances into and out of the nucleus. But the DNA is never going to leave through these pores. The DNA always stays inside of the nucleus. Inside of the nucleus, there is an organelle known as the nucleolus. And the nucleolus, uh, think about it as the manufacturing site for ribosome production. All cells, whether they are prokaryotes or eukaryotes, they do have ribosomes. Ribosomes, which look something like this, they are responsible for making proteins. In eukaryotic organisms, those ribosomes, you can find them either on the surface of the nucleus, so they would be located on the nuclear envelope, or they would be attached to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which we will talk about next. In prokaryotes, they do have ribosomes, and their ribosomes are usually in the cytosol, which is the fluid inside of the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum found in eukaryotic organisms they look something like this, like a bunch of tunnels. There are two groups of endoplasmic reticulum. There's the smooth endoplasmic reticulum and there's the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Now the reason why the smooth ER, we refer to it as smooth because if you look at its outer surface, it looks pretty smooth. It does not have those bumps on its surface as the rough ER does. Depicted right here by those red uh, bumps right here. And those are actually ribosomes. So the th smooth ER does not have any ribosomes on its surface, while the rough ER do have those ribosomes on its surface. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum helps in making lipids. It also helps with detoxification, detoxification of drugs and alcohol. 
So if you think about which cells in your body are going to have more smooth endoplasmic reticulum, an example would be your liver cells, since our liver help us with detoxifying things like alcohol. And so your liver cells are definitely going to have more smooth ER compared to your muscle cells. The rough endoplasmic reticulum, as we said, it's rough because it has those ribosomes on its surface, and we do know that ribosomes help make proteins. So the ribosomes are going to make the proteins on the surface of the rough ER, and then those proteins are going to be sent into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And the job of the rough endoplasmic reticulum is to go ahead and package those proteins. Where are those proteins going to go? Well, those proteins might either uh, leave the cell or those proteins are going to be sent to the plasma membrane and get embedded and become part of the plasma membrane. Or those packaged proteins are going to become a new organelle called lysosomes. So right here in this image, Let's go ahead and take a look at the rough ER and what it does. So you can see that right here is the rough endoplasmic reticulum with the ribosomes on its surface. The ribosomes are going to help make the proteins. The proteins are going to enter into the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And you can see that part of the rough endoplasmic reticulum gets pinched off right here. So uh, this pinched off part of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which we now refer to as a transport vesicle, is carrying a bunch of proteins. Now where are those proteins going to go? They're actually going to make a stop at this organelle right here known as the Golgi apparatus. As you can see, the vesicle actually merges in with the membrane of the Golgi apparatus and it deposits the proteins that it's carrying. Think of the Golgi apparatus as the post office, where the post office uh, accepts your package, takes the package, stores it, and then tags the package for you with its final destination. And that's what the Golgi apparatus does. It accepts the proteins from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It can store the proteins within it. And then it can go ahead and ship them out. But before it ships out the proteins, it will tag them so that the proteins would go to their final destination. And how is the Golgi apparatus going to ship out those proteins? Same thing as the rough ER, part of the Golgi apparatus is actually going to get pinched off and we're going to get those vesicles one more time carrying those proteins. Those proteins are tagged to go to their final destinations. So some of those proteins are actually going to exit completely the cell and go to another cell. Some of them are going to get embedded within the plasma membrane and become part of the plasma membrane, or some of those packaged proteins are actually going to become a new organelle called the lysosome. Lysosomes contain digestive enzymes, which means they carry enzymes that will help break down things, such as food, uh, old cellular components, meaning that, let's say, inside of your cell, you have a bunch of organelles that just died. You do not want to keep all of those dead organelles inside of the cell, so the lysosome is going to break it down. You can think of the lysosome as the trash can inside of our cell. And they're pretty important because they are getting rid of all of that debris um, inside of your cells. They can also help you break down non-functional tissue, such as uh, an example would be the tissue in between your fingers before we were born, those webs, the lysosomes break it down for us. It can also break down or destroy invasive organisms like bacteria. And you can see right here in this image, you have a dead organelle, the lysosome 
swallows it up and digests it inside of itself. Another organelle that we are going to discuss is peroxisome. Peroxisomes are actually vesicles that were formed uh, by getting pinched off from the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Those peroxisomes, they are carrying a bunch of enzymes such as the enzyme known as catalase. And those enzymes within the peroxisomes, they break down harmful substances such as alcohol and formaldehyde. Um, another substance that actually peroxisome breaks down is hydrogen peroxide. If you've ever used hydrogen peroxide to disinfect your wound, you would notice that uh, once you pour the hydrogen peroxide on your wound, it bubbles. And that's because when hydrogen peroxide is broken down, it breaks down into water and oxygen. So what's bubbling um, is basically the oxygen gas being released. So peroxisomes inside of your cells, they have the ability to break down hydrogen peroxide. Uh, if you're wondering how would you get hydrogen peroxide inside of your cells in the first place, when there are chemical reactions taking place inside of your cell, one of the byproducts that come out of these reactions is hydrogen peroxide. And the thing is, hydrogen peroxide cannot stay inside of your cells. It would actually start to harm your cell. And so having peroxisomes is really important because it's going to start breaking down uh, the hydrogen peroxide. Um, you would find peroxisomes um, in high numbers in your liver uh, and in your kidneys because those two organs are known to help you detoxify. And so therefore, you would find a high number of peroxisomes in your liver and kidneys. Another organelle found in eukaryotes are mitochondria. Mitochondria, those are pretty important. We refer to them as the powerhouse of your cell. And the reason why we refer to them as the powerhouse is because they are responsible in making energy which we refer to as our ATP. And the process of making ATP inside of your cells is known as cellular respiration. So cellular respiration takes place within the mitochondria and it helps us make ATP. If you look at cells under the microscope, you notice that cells under the microscope have a shape. And so how are those cells maintaining their shape and maintaining their structure? They have a bunch of proteins that we refer to as the cytoskeleton. Cyto meaning cell and skeleton. When you think of skeleton, you think of your bones. So why did we call it cytoskeleton? Because when you think of your whole entire body, what's giving structure to your whole entire body is basically your bones. So uh, therefore, we say that the proteins that are maintaining the structure of the cell uh, is known as the cytoskeleton, which is basically a bunch of proteins that are going to help uh, maintain the shape and the structure of the cell. And those three proteins are microfilaments, intermediate filaments, and microtubules. You look at this image right here. So let's say this is the inside of your cell. Notice how there are those uh, rods and it looks like a bunch of ropes scattered inside of the cell. And those are basically the cytoskeleton proteins. We have the microfilaments. And the microfilaments are the smallest out of the three protein filaments that we have. Those microfilaments, they're actually composed of a protein known as actin. Uh, the microfilament is definitely important in maintaining the shape and the structure of your cell, but it also participates in muscle contraction. And the reason why it's actually pretty important in the 
in your muscles contracting because it turns out that your muscles contain the actin protein and without the actin protein your muscles would be paralyzed. The intermediate filaments they look something like this and they definitely also help maintain the structure and the shape of your cells. Microtubules they are the largest um, in diameter as you can see and those microtubules uh, one more time they are very important in maintaining the structure and the shape of our cells uh, microtubules also help fix the organelles in place inside of the cell so it helps um, kind of um, it keeps order it maintains the order inside of your cell because there are lots of organelles inside of your cells lots of these organelles are moving around so those microtubules you can think of them as they are going to act as railroad tracks to kind of help organize um, the organelles as they are moving around inside of the cell uh, microtubules also form cilia um, and cilia, they're going to help propel um, particles. Um, microtubules also form flagella, which can help uh, with movement. And microtubules also form microvilli. And those microvilli, they will help increase the surface area of a cell, uh, which basically means uh, microvilli, when you have them, uh, your cell can absorb uh, more particles. So for example, you would have uh, microvilli lining your small intestine because this is where you're digesting your food and so therefore you would want to absorb lots of nutrients within your small intestine. For example, you would have cilia lining your um, respiratory tract uh, because you would want the cilia to sweep away any dust particles before it reaches your lungs. Some features to help with movement are flagella and cilia. An example of a human cell that has a flagella attached to it are sperm cells. So sperm cells right here, as you can see, they have those flagella attached to them and having those flagella help the sperm cells swim and move. Another, features, uh, another feature that cells can have are cilia. And cilia, as you can see, they're pretty small hair-like structures and they keep swaying back and forth and when they sway back and forth they create movement so our trachea which is like your respiratory tract does have cilia lining its surface and the reason why we have cilia lining our respiratory tract so that when the cilia sways back and forth it can actually move away any dust or particles from reaching your lungs.